Hello, one and all, and welcome to the podcast we call The Fantastical with myself, Stephen Nussbaum, in the podcast where I invite my guests to come on and talk to me all about their musical tastes, their memories, their experiences, and they get to collect their fantasy festivals, which I have christened Fantastical. So the podcast is finally back. I hope everyone had a lovely Easter. I'm sorry the podcast was away for so long and it's a pleasure to be back in everyone's ears. I had a lovely time. I went to Butlins, had lots of nice family downtime and I've also been listening to some absolutely fantastic new music. There's so much out there for everyone to listen to. There's so many great gigs going on at the moment, so much to consume and get involved with. So I hope everyone is well at this point. So my last episode was 124. I'm back with 125. I'm delighted to come back with a bang and introduce this gentleman from the superb, the brilliant senses. It's the bass player from the band. It's the one and only, it's Mr. Ronan O'Connor. Hello, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Really excited about this. Ronan, I can't wait to talk to you all about your musical taste and the new album and your fantasy festival lineup. Before we do, I always love to check in with my guests, find out how they've been from a mental health perspective. Hope everyone is on good form. So, Ronan, as a starting point, mate, how are you? Really appreciate you for asking. Yeah, doing really good, thank you. Um, we played a gig on Saturday and then we partied until Sunday and um, fully recovered now from that and, yeah, focused, you know, for lots of exciting things coming up. How are you doing? All good. Like I said, I haven't. this is the first podcast back in almost a month, so for me it's like... Um, a therapy session almost to be back out there talking to great people about music about the great output that they've got how was the hangover on sunday ronan by the way we were woken up we didn't need to set our alarms we had the manchester marathon running beneath our window so we were woken up by that and um yeah surprisingly not too bad considering that we, we i think we started playing the gig at two and we probably made it home about half four in the morning wow. so uh, yeah, it wasn't too bad. Well played. Well played, Squire. So before we talk about music, tell us a bit about yourself, Ronan. So obviously I introduced you, bass player from The Senses, but we were speaking before we started about what you do. You sound like a very interesting fella. So tell us a bit more about the man and the myth, the legend behind Ronan O'Connor. Oh, I wouldn't go that far. That's some sort of build-up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've travelled around and, you know, this probably makes it more difficult, you know, for our band I'm currently living in Hamburg over in Germany. Before that, I lived in Italy and then going back, lived in Germany and then Italy. So I haven't lived in the UK for 12 years, which obviously makes being in a UK based band pretty difficult. But yeah, I work in sort of education, in research, um, writing. So writing sort of textbooks for teachers in Italy, researching. So, you know, working in the field of sociology yeah so lots of lots of little different things to keep me busy and keep me out of trouble yeah it sounds really interesting i think we could probably do a podcast all on that as a standalone but ronan let me take you back then how did you first get into music i think you, you know we're all second generation irish and we just grew up around music my dad he played in a skiffle band back in ireland in the 60s i thought they fancied themselves as like the quarrymen type thing, you know, washboard, guitars, harmonica, that type of thing. And two of my uncles were in it as well. And they're related to Ian, who's the drummer in the band, Finney, my cousin. So, you know, he grew up in that same sort of environment as well. And we we even joined uh, Kyoltus, which is an Irish association for music. So we were playing Bauron and Tim Whistle when we were probably eight or nine and this sounds like it's it's been totally made up about meeting a traveling uh, fiddle player so i think he was um a roma gypsy and amazing fiddle player that would just travel around and sit in on sessions and he turned up at our cultus once i didn't realize at the time that you know he was quite famous within the folk circuit i think he was playing at Cambridge Folk Festival maybe a week or two after and then after sort of playing there he took 
my cousin and me aside and he said you know you need to go and learn a stringed instrument and it was kind of some like mystical being that sort of just happened upon us and i think we both went home and we were nagging our parents you know buy us a guitar and i was for some reason you know being taller than the others i was like all right i'll have the bass buy us a bass and yeah my, my parents and i think finney's parents were like oh, it's going to be like, you know, the skateboard and the roller skates. I never had them, by the way. That was more Finny. I think he used to go to roller discos. And they're just like, oh, it's going to end up, you know, just in the garage and you're not going to use it. And we just kept on and on. So as it came up to Christmas, they were like, right, we'll buy it for you. But if, if you don't play them, you know, we're not going to buy you anything again. <laughs> so I think that's why that's why we're still playing them now. <laughs> And obviously that was quite a young age. So tell us about kind of bands that were came before Senses. Did it start as, as bands with mates and cover bands or have you always been doing your own your own material? So really what happened, you know, we were kind of getting into this, this sort of stuff and um, I think we were probably around 12 or 13 at this time now and we were in school one day and we had no football. It was lashing down with rain. We didn't want to go outside, so we pretended to leave our classroom at break time, snuck back in and hid in one of the music rooms. I think our plan was to do a Royal Rumble in there. <laughs> and at that sort of age, you know, you think you're being subtle. And you, can think, you think you're getting away with a wrestling match but and being subtle yeah. and not thinking that the music teacher would hear you. But he came in and caught us. And as punishment, he made us stay behind and empty a van. So we emptied this van and we carried all the boxes up to the music rooms in our school. And they were full of like bass amps, guitars, guitar amps, drums. So we unboxed the stuff and we're just like, wow, this is amazing. And he said, if you want to play them, come back next week. So we turned up and we've been a band ever since. So that was with Callan, who's, you know, one of our best mates. Uh, Finney, Callan and myself were in the same year group. And then, you know, we, we started playing and we had another friend in on drums at that time. The school were really good. They they said, oh, we'll, we'll get someone in to teach you how to be in a band. And basically their job was to stop us arguing, to get us to try to play at some point. You know, anyone that's ever been in a band knows that three quarters of the time is spent arguing and taking the mickey out of each other. And then you spend the last quarter trying to do a bit of rehearsing or something so these two guys clive and steve who were with the coventry center of performing arts they said to us right three months time you're going to do your gig at coventry university so we had to write some songs and you know i think we were probably 13 year olds who were like yeah we could do that so it was very exuberant fast-paced poppy punk stuff i guess which wasn't necessarily reflective of our influences or the music we were listening to. But I think it was more that that's the, all we could play, you know, sort of three chords. And yeah, so we went and played this gig at uni and oh, it was amazing just being up on stage. It just, I think it awoke something in, in us. You might not think it now, but yeah, I, I used to be really shy. I didn't want to talk to, like I didn't want to put my hand up in school or answer anything. So being up on stage there was a real eye opener. And um yeah, Finney had no problems. He was always a show off. Um, so he, he was a duck in water for that. But yeah, we, like they were asking for an encore, but we had only written three songs in those three months. So we had to play the first song again. But yeah, it was pretty good. So yeah, and things just evolved from there. We just carried on playing, writing. And then I think when we were about 15, we just used to put our, our own gigs on a local social club. So it would literally just be a free-for-all. So all these underage people back then turning up at a social club. And, you know, back then you could get served. So our mates loved it as an excuse to, to get out. And we'd have, you know, three, four hundred people from school and stuff there invading the stage. And we thought we'd never get asked back. But I think they actually liked making so much money. So they kept asking us to go back. And we had a bit of a... Um, you know, a residency there. So, I yeah, the Beatles went to Hamburg to cut their teeth and we went to <laughs> Radford Social Club and, uh, the, yeah, the Jaguar Social Club there. 
And it sounds like the lineup's been pretty consistent ever since. So you've kept them writing, kept them working at it, and it takes you up to current day. I mean, obviously with technology nowadays, and you've said you live in Germany, you've been between Italy and Germany for the last twelve years or so. I guess it can work being in a bet, although not ideal. It does, you, it does, or can work being in one place with the rest of your band or somewhere else. Yeah. So you know, we all went off to university, and well. Again, Callan and I went to the same university and Finney went up to Liverpool and, you know, either we'd be up visiting him or he'd be down um, staying with us and he'd miss maybe two weeks of lectures and just stay there hanging out with us. So we were always sort of like still sharing ideas and stuff. And it was after uni that Cavi joined us. So, you know, he'd been a friend all that time and he was into the same music and he had been playing guitar, but he was a couple of years younger than us. And then when we finished uni, you know, we just started practicing. And I think we just got the bug and we'd practice and practice like, you know, every day. There was a local pub and they were, you know, kind enough to just give us their back room for nothing. We'd be in there practicing, writing stuff and then, you know, gigging all around the country. Um, so we kind of cut our teeth with that. And then... You know, when we went on a hiatus, we went on a hiatus of, of gigging and doing stuff like that. But we were all writing and, you know, sharing ideas and developing ideas. So that was always going on in the background. And I think it was, you know, The Kills were probably the first band that made me realise that it could work. Because, you know, one of them lived in London and the other one in New York. And I think that was probably even in the days of dial-up, so... You know, if they could make it work, then we we could make it work. Just sending ideas over. And, you know, the beauty of it is that we can just record something on our phones and send it over and someone else records other bits and, you know, sends it back. And we've got sketches. So, you know, that that's how we've done a lot of stuff, really. And as we are on this podcast, as we sit here during the week, you've got an album about to drop. By the time this goes out, you'll have an album. So... This year's been quite busy in terms of releases. You already had three singles released or three tracks released, which are all fantastic, by the way. You got Harder Now for Love, Drop Your Arms and We're Not Wanted, all released and available on spot in, uh, streaming platforms that are all fantastic. And you're about to release your debut album, Little Pictures Without Sound. And by the time this goes out, this would have been released. So I guess tell us about the album and, and how the process has worked of how you've got the album ready. So really, you know, we um, the songs on there, you know, we've had them from the start, really, some of them, and, you know, they've evolved. And basically what happened, we recorded with, and we recorded in a local studio and did a couple of demos. And we sent this demo to Steve Lamack, and he ended up putting one of the songs into the unsigned chart that they did at that time. And it stayed in the unsigned chart for months. And off the back of that, we had a lot of label interest and, you know, famous producers. I don't know if I should drop any of the names, but we didn't end up working with any of them. I think we were so naive that we were we were managing ourselves and we really didn't know what to do. And so we had these new songs knocking about that we wanted to record and I think um, I think it was Gavin Monaghan that reached out to us and he recorded editors and the twang who were both, you know, based around the Midlands at that time. And after speaking to him for maybe 10, 15 minutes, I just knew that we had a shared vision. And, you know, it wasn't even just talking about the music. It was, you know, who he is as a person. So, you know... He really wanted to record with us, so we set up one session, and I think the first thing that we recorded with him, we ended up sending it to to an agent and to Janice Long on, you know, she was on Radio 2 at the time, and it wasn't even mixed or anything, and she ended up playing it on Radio 2, and, you know, things just carried on from there, really. So we just kept going back in, recording stuff, and the whole process really took about a year. Um, so these were kind of the rough, unmixed ideas. So we kept getting delayed for, you know, other bands that were in there recording, you know, big sign bands. And then we had, you know, a few different labels interested in stuff. 
we had um, Shifty Disco, who I think the Young Knives and Scouting for Girls were on. They released one of the tracks that we'd recorded early in the sessions as a single, and I think it was one of their best-selling um, releases to date with that. And then the plan was to, you know, get someone to release the album for us. And I don't know how, but we ended up getting in touch with, or they got in touch with us, a label from Japan. And, it, you know, they they were really into it. They loved the stuff. But then by the time we had sort of started finishing stuff, they were like, oh, have you got any dance music? And we're like, uh, no. <laughs> um, so they were like, well, our agenda for, you know, the next year it's going to be more dance orientated. So, yeah, we're not going to be able to release it. So, you know, we were kind of left with these these rough ideas that we had. The plan was always to go back and, you know, re-record stuff once the label had come in and come on board. So then we just went on a hiatus and it was really lockdown that made us realise, you know, we're still writing and still sending ideas and sharing stuff, but we need to go back and you know, write that wrong and finish that first album, those first batch of songs. So that's really, you know, what led to it. So, you know, we got back in touch with Gavin and somehow he still had the old stems and, you know, we could revisit things and, you know, have new parts put down and stuff. So, yeah, I was, I think, yeah, it was a bad lockdown in Italy. So I was, it was tough life when I was hanging out around a pool on Lake Como and having to, you know, reignite the album. But someone had to do it. I'm amazing that it's happened. So 10 tracks all come out on the album. I'm looking forward to that. The singles have been incredible, like I said. Um, so Thank I think you. I think it's going to do really well. I think there's a lot of people waiting for that. And obviously 42 Records are releasing that. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. In terms of live dates to support the album, tell us about some live dates or any live dates that you have coming up. So, you know, we, we did a real sort of amazing little gig at FC United of Manchester, and that was on the 15th. So for us, you know, that was beautiful because you've got people there who, you know, they're, they're supporting a football club that has gone through adversity. So we felt that, you know, kindred spirits of us and the adversities that we'd have had to go through. But yeah, amazing setup there, amazing people. So that was like our dress rehearsal, really. So, yeah, the album launch is on the 21st of April. So we're playing a sold-out gig at the Tin Arts and Music in Coventry. And, again, you know, it's it's a group of people who we really buy into their ethos and what they do, not just through the, the venue, but, you know, through their record label as well. And they're really collaborative and supportive of of that. So, you know... We didn't want it just to be a gig, so the idea is that we wanted it to be a, a party, really, and we've invited uh, people along that, you know, we want to see and that we want to celebrate with. So, you know, we've got Leah McGrath on, I don't know if, you, if you've seen her, but she's a young singer-songwriter from Coventry and an absolutely amazing voice. Um, I think, you know, she's, she's going to do really well and... I think we'll hear a lot more of her over the next year and in a bit. And then we've got Tarragon, who are signed to, I think, Luna Sky Records. Um, it's kind of like the brainchild of Callum Picard, who is just, you know, a musical prodigy. He, you know, he's playing drums, keys, guitar on a lot of the stuff. But on his album that he's released, he's collaborated with, you know, members of The War on Drugs, um, Bon Iver, Supertramp, and, you know, making absolutely amazing, beautiful music. And then we've got the Institutes playing as well, who I think, you know, it's, it's great seeing the new music community being so supportive of each other. But our sort of bond with the Institutes goes back, you know, to when we were kids because we went to school with a couple of them so andy low and andy hall you know we were in the, the same school as them lowy lived opposite my house where i grew up and i started playing bass and you know he started getting into music and asking about it and then he was asking me if i had an amp that he could have so i sold him my old amp and i think he still uses it in his practice room 
so you know growing up and seeing them go through you know different bands and different lineups um has been amazing and you know the success that they've had it's been special and you know it was just a real coincidence that we ended up on the same label which is really mad you know two bands from coventry ending up on a manchester label together huh. but i think that says more about you know the shared influences that we've got and you know the mentality and mindset and you know really sort of 42's records and you know we wouldn't have got to the point of getting the album out because we've had so many setbacks with it and you know they stepped in they've really sort of come through with it for us as well so you know they're there to celebrate the night with us as well but you know we, we went that step further really of we had a friend you know bassist from a band who he runs theatre projects and he's a photographer in Coventry. We commissioned him to do a series of photographs for the the gatefold of the vinyl. And, you know, he's going to be exhibiting some of his photos in the venue. We've got a studio from uh, Portugal who've done work with um, Panda Bear and Sonic Boom and, you know, lots of other sort of labels and stuff. So they're doing sort of 40, 50 minute visual set of visuals for us. So we want it to be, you know, when we're playing a real sort of immersive experience. So there's going to be multiple projectors and all of these things. So, you know, it's just a celebration really. And then to follow that up, you know, if that wasn't enough, we've got certain songs that we think would be more fitting of, you know, being stripped back a little bit more. So the day after and probably 500 meters away in hmv coventry we're lucky enough to be playing the uh, live and local session there so that's on 22nd of april in hmv coventry at three o'clock so yeah we're really looking forward to you know that whole weekend it's gonna be a fantastic weekend i look forward to seeing all the uh, videos and tweets and insta posts around it i'm sure everyone's gonna have a great time i guess speaking of social ronan where can people find senses on social media so we're on we're mainly active on Twitter um, at Senses Coventry, and it's the same handle on Instagram and Facebook. And in terms of your own music, Ronan, what do you like listening to? So obviously, I know Senses, and I know the sound of Senses, and I presume most people listening will do. But in terms of your own musical taste, is it similar to what Senses sound like, or do you listen to different stuff? I think it was, you know, when we were. When we were first start, starting to write the stuff, you know, we were really into Stone Roses, Ride, lots of shoegaze bands and, you know, indie. But we always had very eclectic love of music. Um, you know, Ian and I had lots of Irish folk influences. Callan, his dad played guitar as well. And he was really into, you know, the Hanks, Hank Williams and, you know, country stuff. Um, so even if we're not actively listening to it, you know, we, we've got all that influence. And then Cavi grew up, you know, listening to lots of Motown and stuff. So we started sharing these at a really young age. And, you know, I think even if we never really actively sought to put it into the music, we'd put stuff in or we, we'd be really into, you know, Northern Soul, Motown. And I think some of us lean certain ways and, you know, some of our first albums, you know, are probably a testament to that. And we, we kind of tried to pull it together a little bit. So, yeah, it's, it's so eclectic. But, you know, right now, this, the stuff that I'm listening to, um, I love listening to, to new stuff and, you know, checking out new bands. So, obviously, what, you know, one of my big sort of lockdown finds and loves was Dictator. Um they were just a band that, you know, hadn't heard stuff like that for a long time. That was so interesting, emotive, intelligent, and, you know, coming at a time when you needed it, it was a real remedy for that. So I think, you know, and then, you know, lots of bands have come since. Um, we were talking earlier and we mentioned Arcade State. You know, they're, they're another band who I think they just sound so polished and ready for moving on to that bigger stage there's you know sylvie there's another coventry artist who's on a little bit of a hiatus at the minute over in canada inez doing great stuff so i'm you know listening to all of that 
but then I always go back to lots of you know lots of things um stuff like the national velvet underground i think sigur ross they're the bands that really sort of i always keep going back to i'm trying not to mention some <laughs> of the bands that are coming in the festival but yeah like i never tire of of that sort of stuff and Spaceman Three. I think probably my most played album though in the last the last year has been the Panda Bear Sonic Boom one reset. And the way that they've taken samples and, you know, they've taken things that I loved from hearing them from my parents, you know, like Eddie Cochran and, you know, some of the muscle shoals bass lines and stuff. And they've they've done something so intelligent and inventive with it and taken this one little snippet of a song that they thought was genius and then they've turned it into a whole song. It's kind of, you know, showing the evolution, I think, of what you would normally class as sort of indie alternative musicians to to get into that sort of phase of borrowing and recycling and reusing that hip hop has done so well. Great stuff. A lot of great acts mentioned there. Dictator, Sylvie, Arcade State, all been on the podcast. All uh, a fantastic new music acts to watch out for. So great to see some mentions for those guys. Let me take you back then, Ronan. Let me take you back to when you were a smaller lad, had some money in your pocket, and it was time to buy your first musical purchase. <laughs> Do you remember what they were and where you bought them and, and the stories behind them? I think, you know, I was so lucky growing up that I had an amazing neighbour who I think wanted or saw that I was a lost soul and wanted salvation for me. So my first albums came from her and her name's Julie. And I grew up and um, I'd be in the back garden playing with her brother who was closer to my age. Like, you know, she was probably 18, 19 at the time and going to music festivals. So she was going to like, you know, very early Reading and, I'd see the band T-shirts on her line, so it'd be things like the Wonder Stuff, the Smiths, and I just, I was, my curiosity was peaked even then, you know, like, how, like who are these people that you want to wear a T-shirt of? And um, she gave me my first ever vinyl, which was Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction. And then, you know, after growing up listening to Irish stuff that my parents would play, Rockabilly, you know, the Beatles, Stones, that kind of the popular stuff, Manfred Mann, putting Guns N' Roses on on a hi-fi, you know, the big, massive hi-fis that everyone used to have back then, putting Appetite for Destruction on, I was just like, what is this? And then I think the next week I was asking my mum, could I get a top hat and a bandana? <laughs> and she just laughed at me. So, uh, yeah. And then when it came round to CDs coming out, you know, she was like my neighbour, Julie again, she was like, I had I bought a CD player and had no CDs, and she was like, oh, "I'll give you a couple." So she gave me um, the Levelers, Level in the Land, I think it was, and I really got into them in a big way. And then the other one was Nevermind, which again talk about Guns N' Roses blowing my mind. Nevermind was just something that blew me away, and yeah, I ended up getting. Doc Martins and wearing plaid shirts for the next couple of years. And it was at that time, you know, I was starting to play bass and, yeah, I I was trying to learn the songs and, you know, just get into it that way. So they were my first ones, which probably, apart from Callan, you know, ours were infinitely cooler than um, (laughs) maybe some of the others. Great show. You mentioned some absolutely iconic albums there. So obviously, this podcast, Ronan, is all about you collating your fantasy festival. Are you a big festival fan? Have you been to many? Do you know what? I've I've not been to many, and I'm not really a fan of them, um, or a Watson. I think we always used to go to the Godiva Festival, which was a, it, it was at that time, you know, a free festival in Coventry, mm. and we used to get amazing acts. Now, you know. I don't think it's that expensive, but you have to pay to go to it now. But, you know, over the years, I saw, you know, Super Furry Animals cast Kasabian a couple of times, The Enemy play there. And, you know, that was that was local. It was something good. Um, but one thing that always put me off was some of the, you know, the behaviour of some of the people and, you know, throwing pints of dubious things. So I think really what we used to do 
Cavi and I used to go over to Spain. So for a few years running, we'd go over to Spain and go to festivals there. And, you know, it was the weather as well, I think. You know, I'm, I'm a fair weather festival person. So, you know, being on a beach near Barcelona in 30-odd degrees, sleeping out under the stars was far nicer and far more appealing to me than going yeah. to Glastonbury and getting stuck in mud. And we could eat, you know, nice falafel and... <laughs> Who must rap? So. <laughs> so yeah, like Cavi and I, we'd go and you know Axe would Axe would come on maybe at four or five in the evening and play through until you know four in the morning. Um, then there'd be DJs and stuff. So that was really our sort of our thing um, for Cavi and I. So we saw some amazing acts over there. You know, even if it wasn't stuff that we were necessarily into. You know, things like craft work. You know, I think that was the joy of the festival for us. You know, someone like seeing someone like that. We got to see like Lou Reed and uh, Brian Wilson. I think you know a few of the big headliners then Oasis, Kasabi, and that type of thing. So it was a nice mix of stuff on. I know that Callan's favourite one was Coachella, and um, I think he needs to get a crochet top and selfie mm-hmm. stick and go back there for what it is now. Yeah, iconic festival. Sounds like you had some great experiences, but do you have a favourite gig, Ronan, or one you can share about spoiling your fantasy festival lineup? Is there one gig for you that is the one, or was that going to spoil your, your fantasy it's, festival lineup? It's a spoiler because two of them played together on oh, the wow. same gig, and yeah, so it's kind of probably to relive that a little bit and this spiritual moment shall we say all right i'm looking forward to it so like i said at the top of the podcast it's all about getting our guests so we have ronan with us and ronan gets to play his fancy festival so ronan gets to choose any five acts one of who must play one of their studio albums in full and ronan also gets to pick an encore which all of his five acts can play together at the end of his fantasy festival to close it's a very simple five acts take five time slots. So in the last episode of the podcast, which feels like ages ago, I had Ben Todd on from the excellent Moonlight Parade. He created his Lost Souls Fantasy Festival. He had the Lars opening up in his opening slot for him. In Super Seconds, he had Michael Head and the Red Elastic Band. In his Midway Madness slot, he had the War on Drugs. In his pre-headline slot, he had Doves playing their album Lost Souls in full. And for his headline act, he had Radiohead. And to close his Fantasy Festival, he had all five of his acts playing Natalie's Party, which was a song by Shaq. So great lineup there, great encore as well. So that's how simple it is for any first-time listeners listening to the podcast. So I'm looking forward to hearing all about your acts, Ronan. But before we do, we need to give your Fantasy Festival a name and we need to give it a venue somewhere. So Ronan, what are you going to call your Fantasy Festival? I think we'll have to come back to that one. All right, let's go. Um, we'll come back to that one. But I really want to go to the Lost Souls Festival. You'll see why. All right. Okay. We might have some crossover potentially. So, Ronan, we can you can take us anywhere you want. We can go to Hamburg. We can go to Italy. We can go to Coventry. We can go to wherever you want to take us. We'll follow for you to put on your unnamed festival as it is so far. So, where do you want to hold your fantasy festival? So, this one's an easy one. We're going to have to head over to Italy. We'll go to Liguria. Lovely little beach just outside of uh, Genoa, Comoli. We can have it there. There's, you know, beautiful little castle in the background. You can eat pasta and pesto and focaccia and farinata until your heart's content. You know, we don't need to worry about the uh, the food. We're not going to have any burger vans. And, you know, looking out over the Mediterranean uh, with the festival going on, I think it'll be perfect backdrop for it really all right i'm there i can't wait so we're going to Ligoria in italy first time we've been there i'm looking immensely forward to it so before you talk about your five acts ronan any acts you want to mention quickly who you love but somehow aren't coming with us to your as yet untitled fantasy festival so again you know this was this was too tough you really put people to it steve we need to Ah. extend it for a weekend Ah. So, you know, there's a couple of influences on me and bands that I just love seeing. So I think the first one is probably one of the bands that I've seen the most, and that's the Charlatans. So, you know, we'd we'd travel over to see them in Wolverhampton, in Birmingham, uh, whenever they were playing. So I've seen them loads of times. Yeah, they just sort of missed the cut, really. Maybe Tim will want to do some sort of, like, listening party for the festival. 
Oh, that's we'll a good shout. Involved. That's a good shout. He's loving we'll the podcast. Get him involved though, some way. Yeah. All right. So Charlotte's um, aren't coming. Anyone and then, else? and then another one is the, the Black Angels. So I think they're on maybe their sixth album. And for me, you know, they they're still being so creative with what they're doing. They're not changing wholesale what they are as a band, but the quality's there and the ideas are there. And, you know, I think it's um, Wilderness of Mirrors, their last album. It's just been on repeat really as well for me. So I think, yeah, they just missed out as well. I did toy with the idea of having, you know, we always liked some some more left field things now and again. So, you know, DJs, the Chemical Brothers, um, the stuff that they do, the remixes, you know, amazing. Air, someone that I've seen at Bene Kassim, and I think they really stole the show one of the years at Bene Kassim. They were playing in a small tent, and, you know, just the, the vibe and atmosphere in there was amazing. So, yeah, they've just missed out. And then, unfortunately, I wanted to put the Institutes on because Coliseums by them, that's you know, it's been re-released on Red Splatter Vinyl and... I love that album and um, not just because they're friends, but I think, you know, there's a real sort of collection of beautiful songs in there. But we decided not to put them on so that they can come and watch the festival with us and, you know, we can get on it and have it together. Great stuff. So the Institutes have been picked for a fantasy festival before, so they're not coming back with us. They were picked by Kevin from The Banes uh, back in an early uh, episode, which was a great episode. So the Institutes not coming with us. Charlatans, Black Angels, Chemical Brothers Air... And the Institute's, like we said, all miss out. So we've gone through your missed acts. It's two o'clock in Italy. It's a lovely day. Everyone's having some lovely food. The sun is shining. It's time for your opening act to come on for your fantasy festival, Ronin. So who's going to open your fantasy festival? So I've mentioned them before, but it's going to be Dictator. And, you know, I think they've got that. They can go from, you know, upbeat to, you know, beautiful sort of more chilled stuff. I think the vocals really stand out and I'm jealous that our singer Callan got to see them, you know, a month or two ago and he was texting me through it and saying, you know, they were unreal. I was like, yeah, don't rub it in. You know, Hmm. he was like, you know, it was really special. What what they were doing was really special and they're not going to be at that level for much longer. They're going to blow up. So I think, you know, introducing them to, you know, a new audience I think their music would go down amazing over in our Italian festival. So yeah, it's got to got to be Dictator, I think. Great shout, great opening act. First time Dictator have been chosen for a fantasy festival. However, we yet have had their bassist on the show as well. So Joe Murty, the fantastic bass player from Dictator, came and collated his Murty Work Fantasy Festival about a year and a half ago now. So I'd love to see Dictator getting picked. Great new music act, and they're going to open your fantasy festival and play from us from two till three. We'll take a half hour break. That'll take us to half past three, and it'll be time for your Super Seconds Act. We're going to get an hour to play. So, Ronan, who, who's going to be your Super Seconds Act? You know, this is someone that's been mentioned today in the podcast as well, and already picked, but Mick Head, and it's up to him who he brings with him. He can bring the Red Elastic Band. He can bring members of Shaq. He can get the Pell Fountains back together. He's a godlike genius in our eyes. And yeah, we got into all these sort of bands that he'd been in. And we went to see him, I think in Nottingham at the rescue rooms. And there were people that were flying down from Scotland and stuff for this gig on a sort of weeknight. He just had that sort of power over people. And it's not even about the numbers of people at the gig. It's, you know, the passion that those people have and the connection with his music. So I think that that's something, you know, when we heard HMS Fable, it was just something that really resonated with us. And we might not sound musically like, you know, Mick Head and the stuff that he's done, but I think certainly that sort of element of having moments of tenderness and then the darkness and the light and hope, I think that's something that we've tried to do in our own way, really, through through our music and our writing and for me you know hms fable really is a journey and you know it's a real fitting name and idea for the album to have that sort of journey and i think that's something that we probably strived to create on some level so i think that's going to be uh the album that we're going to get mick head to play in full as well hms fable i think sets things nicely up then 
Great shout. So Mick Head waited 123 episodes to get picked for a fantasy festival. He now makes it two in a row. So he was on one, two, four. He's on one, two, five, taking your super second at going to play Age of Fable from half past three to half past four. He was super second in the, in the last episode as well. So Mick Head, welcome back to the Fantastival podcast. That's going to be a great set. We'll take a half hour break after he finishes at half past four. That'll take us to five o'clock. Be time for Midway Madness. So who is going to make the madness out of the midway slot at five o'clock, Ronan? Okay. Madness, I'm not sure how fitting that is really for this one, but I wanted to get Tess Parks and Anton Newcomb from the Brian Jonestown Massacre on. I think, you know, Tess Parks has probably been one of the artists over the last sort of five, six years that her, her voices and her songwriting's just really sort of encapsulated this feeling, this that, that I like going to for music, you know, that sort of thread going back to, you know, Velvet Underground and, you know, leading through Brian's Jones Town's Massacre and, you know, Tess Parks really picks that up, that haunting feel. So I get, you know, Mazzy Star vibes at times from what she does. But I think, you know, her work with Anton Newcomb, you know, the way that he's so creative and adds in elements of drones and that, you know, that real sort of spacey vibe. I think that after, after Mick Head, you know, it's just really going to sort of start bubbling then with Tess Parks and her voice is haunting. So, yeah, we're going for Tess Parks and Anton Newcomb. Great shout. So, Anton Newcomb has spoken about a bit in episode 119, back when I had the Magic Mod on, who obviously supported Brian Jonestown Massacre. It's a bit of a nod there to Tess Parks and Anton Newcomb. Midway Madness slot goes to them. That's going to be a great set they're going to play from five till six so three acts down two acts left to go we'll take one more half hour break we'll take us to half past six so your pre-headline acts are going to get an hour and a half to play your fantasy festival so three amazing acts so far but who's going to be your pre-headline act so i think this is another one of the bands that i've probably tied with seeing them the most but yeah primal scream we're going to put the scream on there and from sort of those upbeat songs through to damaged and star i think when the sun's starting to set and you know you can start seeing lights out on the sea things are going to be perfect for for the primals to be on now if we can get manny back in on bass i know that he says that he doesn't want to gig anymore and that carrying the bass is too much for him these days but if we can get him back with the band for one last hurrah in italy you know, I think I think it could be good. Yeah, like I think we've all sort of been into the primals and gone to see them loads. So yeah, getting them in for that sort of slot it, it, it's something we'd want to see, and you know we'd be there sort of dancing away and enjoying that. Great shout, Manny is up for it. He's coming to Italy. He's just sorted out his yes, passport. He's got a light. Manny. He's got a light base. We're we're doing it. So Manny comes with. We I've got primal scream third time. They've been picked for Fantasy Festival lineup. First time I've been picked in a while, though. So we welcome back Bobby and the boys and Manny. They're going to play an hour and a half at your Fantasy Festival. That will take us to 8 o'clock. So like one more half hour break and it'll be time for your headline act. So you've picked a great first four acts to play so far. But who are you going to have, though, as your Fantasy Festival headline act, Ronan? So I think this is the only sort of artist that I could probably never get bored of. And it's going to be spiritualised. I went to uh, a little festival over in Germany, Synthesy Festival. So it's quite sort of psych, um, heavy stuff there. And Spiritualized played at that. Again, you know, a band that we've seen loads. But for this festival, you know, it's fitting to have them there with full gospel choir this time and full orchestra. We're going all out, no expense spared. Hmm. So, yeah, I think, you know, if we can have amazing visuals going on for them and Jay Spaceman sat down to the right on his little chair playing away, I think it's hard for us to be subjective about spiritualized or, you know, the precursor Spaceman 3, really, because there's a real sort of local thread. So Delia Derbyshire was such an innovator musically and being a not just a pioneer in electronic and electro music back in the 60s with what she was doing with the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. 
she um, led the way for a lot of female artists as well, even back from the 60s, you know, and started breaking down barriers. So she's from Coventry. She's actually from the same little part of the city where we're all from. And she did a lot of recording at a studio in Coventry where Spaceman 3 recorded some of their stuff and where we recorded our first ever demo. So, you know, there's this thread there of, you know, we used the same Telecaster and the same Vox amp that they used on stuff on our first ever demo. And, you know, there's these threads that are kind of spiritual in a way. I know it sounds a bit six degrees of Kevin Bacon, but sometimes there's these things floating around in the ether and they're just sort of pulled out and put together. So for us, you know, spiritualized are a special band in that sense and i think you know musically that they can go from the garage rock type stuff you know and we've got elements of that i think going on in some of our songs like harder now for love and you know drop your arms to much more orchestrated grandiose stuff and i think you know the reason why i'm really excited about our album is that People have heard the singles, you know, 42s have done an amazing job picking those singles and, you know, getting things, pe people interested. But I think there's elements on the album that people probably aren't, they're not ready for. And yeah, we're excited for people to hear some of the things, you know, we've had to, we even had to reel ourselves in a little bit. One of the songs started out as an 11 minute epic and hmm. we've got, we've got it down to like six minutes to fit onto vinyl, but we, we think it's still sort of a beautiful, special, tender moment. And a lot of that is thanks to, you know, Spiritualized, because I think they were probably the first band along with Sigur Ross, where we saw people enraptured by their, their beauty and to give them sort of the time and respect for the music. And I think, you know, a lot of bands want to go out and play a set of this term bangers you know to get people dancing around and stuff and that's fine but i think you know if you can do the other thing as well at a gig and still keep people captivated you know there's something special there and you know i've been at gigs with with the lads where we've watched spiritualized and you're sharing that moment together and you look over each other and it's special and i think you know to be able to do that in a place that i love in italy and share that moment share the music it'd be a nice soundtrack to it really great shout lovely words from yourself there Rowan and so third time Spiritualized has been picked for a fantasy festival they're going to headline yours they're going to play from half eight to eleven and at eleven o'clock they're going to welcome back on stage Primal Scream Tess Parks and Anton Newcomb Mick Head and Dictator <laughs> and they will get to play one song it can be any song by anyone ever to close your fantasy festival what are you going to have your lineup play as a collective oh I think this is like I'm, I'm imagining it now I'm there I'm transported you know I think you've got Mick from Dictator back on to do some vocals we've got Mick Head from you know Shaq he's coming on to play a little bit of acoustic guitar Tess Parks joins the gospel choir and she's taken over the lead vocals in that bit you know being a bass player I want to get Manny back in you know spiritualized of an amazing bass player he used to be in um i think star sailor real sort of wonderful bassist but getting manny back in there who you know was an icon to me growing up he's going to be playing bass and then they're going to play ladies and gentlemen we're floating in space going into like they do live very often going into a bit of elvis to finish it off there so you know a nice sort of 10 12 minute outro that burns up in a big beautiful jam great stuff that is a hell of an encore which is going to be an awesome way to end your fantasy festival all right so let's lock it in then we still haven't got a name for your fantasy festival ronan so we could call this the untitled fantasy festival we could call this whatever you want but tight the clock is ticking before we have to lock this one in so we're going to Ligoria in italy opening acts we've got dictator super seconds mick head who's going to play hms fable in full Midway Madness, we're going to have Tess Parks and Anton Newcomb. Pre-headline act, we've got Primal Scream. Headline act, we've got Spiritualized. For your encore, they're all going to play Ladies and Gentlemen. We are floating in space. Does that sound like a good lineup to you, Ronan? I want to go there now. I want to, I want to be there now. As we're just down the road from 
Genoa, beautiful port city. Um, the nickname of the city is La Superba. So, you know, we'll, I think it's a superb lineup. So we've got to go with that. I love it. That is a fantastic name for a fantasy festival. So La Superba is what we are calling your fantasy festival. Great, great lineup there. Great fantasy festival. So before we end this one then, Ronan, obviously by the time this goes out, you know, the album will be released. It'll be in people's ears. I'm sure it's going to go down an absolute storm. So, like I said, by the time this goes out, Little Pictures Without Sound will be on everyone's radar and in everyone's ears. But what's the planning, I guess, or the hopes for 2023 and the rest of the year? We're just really appreciative of the support of, you know, yourself. So thank you for having us on. And we just want to sort of repay that with in people sort of connecting with the music and, you know, getting the word out there to people and, you know, saying thanks. Because we, like, we didn't expect any of this, you know, it was really born from lockdown. So we're appreciative of anyone that listens to us, that asks us on to a podcast that interviews us, the likes, shares, retweets, you know, every single bit of that's appreciated. And for us, really, you know, it sounds cliched, but the music doesn't belong to us anymore from Friday. And I think without getting too philosophical, one of the beautiful things about music is it really spans time as an art form and people associate that music with a certain time and it can it can mean more to you than the span of 40 minutes or whatever the album is you know and it's times of people's lives and the memories that they're having and we hope you know that through the light and dark of this album i think you know the main thing and the one word that we probably keep coming back to is there's an element of hope in there and I think you know with a lot of things that are going on societally people need that more than ever now really and we hope that that album sort of fits that really for people and then sort of beyond that we're going to play these gigs to support it we're starting to look at other sort of special type of, of events that we could play who knows maybe someone invites us to play a festival and we're back in the studio then recording. So we've already started work on the sort of follow-up EP or LP, if it's going to evolve into that. We've got two tracks already finished for that. And I think, you know, we're back in in July. And the plan is to record another four in the week that we're there. And who knows, other things might sort of happen between now and then with, because we're constantly writing and sharing ideas. And we always... We loved the idea and we've heard, and like you've probably heard as well, so many times about people saying, you know, they've got one sort of iconic song and it was one that they had to write in the studio because, you know, they were kind of put on the spot to do it. And we want to sort of challenge ourselves a little bit to do that as well. So, yeah, we'll, we'll be back recording and then, you know, who knows from there, really. Exciting times. What a time to be in senses. I'm sure the album's going to go down really well. So let's give you socials one final push in Ronan. So if anyone doesn't follow you on Twitter or Insta or wants to find you, Ronan, let's give him a shout out. So where can people find all things senses? So senses Coventry on, you know, the usuals, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. So you can watch some of the trippy videos that we put together for, for stuff over there as well. Great stuff. So that is it, everyone. Thank you for listening to the 125th episode of the Fantastical Podcast. If you've enjoyed this one, please subscribe if you listen on iTunes. Very simple to tap that subscribe button. You can also give the podcast a view on iTunes and you can also rate the show if you're listening on Spotify. Very important that you do so. You can stop listening now if you want to, as long as you go and rate the show on Spotify or give us a five star on iTunes. And do not forget to recommend this podcast to all your families and friends. Like Ronan has said, senses on social media, so is the podcast. You can find us on Twitter. So if you don't already, please go and give us a follow at Fantastival P. Or if you're not on Twitter and you want to contact the podcast, you can do so at Fantastival Podcast at Outlook.com. Unfortunately, on this podcast, we don't play music. But I'll get some tracks from Ronan. We'll make a nice Spotify playlist of all his chosen acts and any other songs that he wants to put in. And you'll be able to find that in the episode description. So just scroll down on your episode description and you'll find a nice little link there to a playlist that Ronan has picked for you. So Ronan, you've been my 125th guest. I've loved talking to you. You've come across really passionately, intelligently and all you've spoken about in terms of your music and all your views. I mean, how have you found being on the Fantastical Podcast? It's quite therapeutic in a weird way. <laughs> 
going back and reflecting on things and thinking of the generational sort of influence that you have on you and the way that music fits into your life. And I think, you know, that's really sort of been special about this podcast. So thank you so much. Oh, it's been a pleasure having you on. I look forward to the album on Friday and I'm sure it's going to do really well. I look forward to getting my CD and listening and rinsing it loads and loads. So great, best luck with the album. I look forward to seeing what 2023 brings for you, matey. And I'll be back then with the podcast. So we're taking another break due to bank holidays. Bank holidays have been a nightmare in May. The podcast will return <coughs> on Sunday, the 14th of May with episode number 126. So another break, unfortunately, due to bank holidays. But we are back on the 14th of May. So please make sure to join me. But until then, stay safe, my fantastical friends. Please continue to spread the word. And that word is fantastical. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.